and he was invited to this uh, this this Thelema group in 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 Hollywood, and they had a thing called the the Gnostic Mass, and it's basically an, a, a mass that they do, and it just blew his mind. He used to write to Crowley in England saying, my beloved father and things like this. And there's a genuine affection there. The Crowley was getting, up, was getting on at this point. She was the first person in the United States, I believe, to make an official report of seeing a UFO in the desert. I mean, you couldn't get a Rizzler paper in between these blocks. Thomas Sheridan, how are you, dear sir? I'm great, Chris. It's good to be here. Brilliant. Are you on the Emerald Isle now? Yes, I'm in the the west of Ireland, very beautiful west of Ireland, with the sun shining and it feels nice and springtimey. Well, yes, early summer. How's your life? Uh, very good. I can't. I'm, I'm very busy. Uh, possibly too busy, but because uh, there's lots of hobbies and stuff and things I want to do, I'm missing out on. But I'm at my happiest when I'm working, so I can't really complain, really, you know. Uh, and if you're doing a little, like I'm writing a book at the moment, I'm making a film at the moment, and I have a regular job and a part-time regular job. It's just, it's just uh, if, I ha if I won the lotto, I'd get a team to actually help. The biggest part for me is when you edit the videos. It takes forever, you know, even though it's just a video, you want to clean that up. So if I, I'd love to, if I had won the lotto, that's what I'd do. I'd hire the film people to actually do the editing and stuff. What is what does esoteric mean for people, and what does occult mean? Well, first of all, you just blew my mind with an incredible synchronicity because I'm working on a project with my colleague uh, Sarah Mondaini. We run the the show Focus Focus together, and we were t dealing the other day with the story of how television has been used to actually damage people at the mental health level to make them more compliant to government mandates and so on. And you often think of the obvious ones, you know, the, you know, like the during during the the last three years, the you know the things to make yeah. you afraid, that kind of thing. I'll try to be diplomatic. When we were growing up, we were talking about. She was talking about a TV show. I lived in America for a long time. She was talking about a TV show that was broadcast on the BBC called Threads in the mid '80s about a nuclear attack on Sheffield, and the whole thing was just to destroy your 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 sense of security and to make you feel like this thing was going to happen any minute and there was no hope and at the same time about a year earlier there was one called the day after on american tv which was the highest rated tv movie in american tv at the time a hundred million viewers and they had focus groups and counseling groups it was about a, nu a nuclear attack on lawrence kansas and the same kind of thing it's going to happen you don't have a hope in hell and people came away from these movies genuinely damaged, genuinely in a state of trauma. And this was not by accident. This was not, I don't believe for a minute that this was art. I don't believe for a minute that this was just like, you know, let's address the pressing issue of the hour. I believe that this was a deliberate, these were deliberate processes to psychologically damage the population in order to make them fearful anxiety ridden and to make them ultimately compliant and that actually is esoteric because what that really is is black magic you know the, the definition of black magic is to force your will upon somebody else that's it's as simple as that what you want from somebody you force it upon them against them either not knowing or against their will now the esoteric thing it just basically means those elements of life which stand outside the sort of mainstream conventions other ways of it, you know, say outside science, say it's saying, you know, that kind of world, that there is another reality, there's another way of doing things in the in this in this life, in this universe. And it's glued together by uh mysteries, by synchronicities, by mythology, by these concepts that are out there, they're incorporeal and in that they exist. They they're amongst us, they are part of our existence. 
They're everything from intuitions all the way up to magical rituals, but they're still a fact of life. Mm. And uh, in many ways, they are the underlying antivirus software of the machinations imposed upon us by everyday life. And that's why I, I got interested in them. Something changed in me, Thomas, when I, um, you know, I suffer from chronic drug addiction, which is basically a, a manifestation of child, child, unresolved childhood trauma. And without bore, boring people who probably heard the story before, there, there was one day when things got so low and I got so lonely, cold, starving. I woke up and a few things came into my mind. I did a bit of processing. I looked at the light, the light shining through my blinds, just like this glimmer of light. And something changed in my being, my, my existence. And I knew from that moment, like I'd never see life in the same way again. It it was almost as though the universe had given me a superpower. I guess it was me opening my third eye and realizing that I, we live in a very controlled structure. It can seem really mean because all we relate to relationships within this controlled medium. So basically you like you're worrying what this person thinks about you. You're worrying about like what what job have I got? How how am I perceived? How much money? Da, 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 da. And in that moment, it was like the universe was saying, Do you know what, Chris? You're all right. You're absolutely perfectly fine. Get out there, start living life for you, not trying to appease this this control system. That was my kind of opening to e esoterics, Thomas. Does, um, do, do I make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, this has been spoken about all through history. But to use the Christian parable, you had that St. Paul road to Damascus kind of revelation. You know, this is what Carl Jung calls, you know, stepping into consciousness, where you have existed as a sort of a an existing being. You know, you've been there. You've been in the world. You've been functioning you've been about there but then something happened and and it's often caused by trauma when you're at your lowest ebb carl jung talks about his stepping into consciousness when he was 10 years old when he saw a schoolboy that he went to school with dead of the river from drowning where he lived and it stepped him into consciousness you know so generally if you know there's two kinds of people in this world there's people like myself who kind of it happens slowly. I've never had problems with depression or anything like that. I've been very fortunate in my life that way. It, it happened through a kind of a distillation process, through existence and going through life and experience life. And then there's the folks like yourself. And in some ways, I'm, I have to say this, I'm kind of envious of you for that, that did go down into the shadow world, that did go into the labyrinth, that did go and face the minotaur. And then, like you said, that, sh that shaft of light that came out of nowhere was the actual pure essence of you, who you are below that skin suit, below, what's the word, the conditioning, the Pavlovian experience that you'd gone, been gone through in your life. And then the, that was the real you coming out from behind that. And that's what that was. And it often happens at the darkest moment. It often happens. Some people that make it drive them crazy, they develop a kind of a an egotistic thing they think i've been chosen or something that's rare though. that's very rare the majority of people will, will tell you you know i mean william it happened with the english poet william blake it's an experience i've never it's like uh, people i know have these experiences and i, and I wish i had them i know it's a, i don't want to say I, I i i envy you going into the dark side into the bottom into the, into the labyrinth but that 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 sort of like maslow's peak experience kind of thing that pauline wrote road to damascus that stepping into consciousness uh, anyone like yourself I've ever spoke to about it said it was the, the greatest gift they ever had in their life. This is why when I'm sort of doing life coaching or posting, trying to post inspiration, I try and say to people, you know, there's no such stuff as, there's no such thing as a, a good experience or a bad experience. It's all just experience. And when I look at my life now and I feel very fortunate, um, I, sort of without sounding like I'm bragging, I've achieved every dream I ever had. I've traveled to every place I ever wanted to. I've done all, all, 
all the adventure sports that I kind of admired from the movies, you know, the films growing up and, and, um, you know, I wrote a book and it like did really well. And, and I got a great YouTube channel and meet awesome people. And, and also, um, you know, silly things. I don't like dine out on this, but this year, Thomas, I was made English, English veteran of the year for inspiration, you know, outstanding Congratulations. it says it says 2022 because it they haven't had the <laughs> and but, but my point i'm getting at is like i'm well aware i couldn't be living this existence if i hadn't had the challenges that 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 i have so i don't look at them in any way shape or form as negative but of course the power of the media is there telling you that oh drugs will you know all this this guy needs to turn his life around. And I would say, no, I never turned my life around. I just like kept on going. <laughs> I think it was the, the book Junkie by William S. Burroughs. And he talks about the, the spiritual element of being a heroin addict. And that was covered somewhat in train spotting as well, but to a lesser degree, that the rejuvenation out of addiction was a, an extremely spiritual experience. And I have friends, I've, I've had, for some reason in my life, I've had lots of friends who have been heroin addicts. And they're all, every uh, to, the, to, the, to the individual, whether I was growing up on the north side of Dublin, to today, all decent, kind, highly intelligent people. Mm -hmm. I've never met a heroin addict who, wasn't an, who, who was not intelligent. It's almost like that, it, 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 it's part and part of the pack, package. The intellect and the strong soul here and the uh, amorphous you know, opiate here, you know, and almost like they, they're symbiotic. And it's the same with the alcoholics. Look how many alcoholics are phenomenal writers and actors and things like that. You know, it, it's it's almost like this this interplay of struggle, you know, that 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 leads to greatness. It, you know, they don't call it the blues for nothing, you know. That book was fascinating. I remember there was a, a couple of bits. I, I, I think we're talking about the same book and feel free to tell me if we're not. But the first thing was the I think they called it like the lush rollers where they yeah. went on, they went on the trains at night waiting for the business people who were on their long commute to get home. And they maybe had a beer or something and they, and they fallen asleep and they would just go up alongside them and, you know, remove them of their, their wallet. That's, that's the same, same book, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a boss in New York. He's dead now, so I can talk about him. He used to, he was a heroin addict, and he told me that. And he was like about the Vietnam generation, and he was telling me that like one of the things he did was they used to get when they were like cooking up the the the, the syringe that they would get the water. At one time they had no water, and he went into a church and got it from the baptismal font in the church. <laughs> And uh, he was saying, "I'm going to go straight to hell for that one." And I said, "Well, like think of it, but think of it in a different way. Think it, think of it as like you know, if you have a spiritual belief, God would put that there for you to actually mm. stop you from dying. You know, especially if it's going to wake you up and for the spiritual journey at the end of it." He went down the Christian path, but yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. Mm. So Jack Parsons, let's talk about Jack, a fascinating character. They recently made a um, documentary. Or, or or a drama documentary. What was it called? Strange Angel, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I was on uh, CBS TV in America. Yeah. Mm. Essentially, he was like the guy that was originally behind NASA. Absolutely fascinated with rockets and he, and the attempt to get one into space. And he, him and his buddies, operated out of the desert in in California, so sort of Hollywood sort of area, and. Um, I don't know. I like to think at some point he found this experiment so difficult. You know, the rockets were all flying off. They, they, they certainly weren't weren't getting anywhere near quote unquote space, whatever whatever that might be. And he got invited to the Lima, which was Alistair Crowley's. What do we call that? Like a cult, a dark dark religion or something. It's just basically a religion. It's not even dark. It's just it's a religion. Yeah. And uh, well, what happened was he grew up in a uh, he grew up in Southern California, and he, since he was a boy, him and his friend Ed were obsessed with um, science fiction. It's it's very interesting. It's it's almost like a, it's almost like a, a chaos magic life in itself. 
And they were obsessed with science fiction and they used to build little rockets in Pasadena in their backyard and they would blow, blow try to launch rockets. So he became in, interested in rockets and uh, he basically his family fell out of money and things like that. So he ended up kind of, you know, working in factories and chemical plants, stealing chemicals to try and build his own rockets as a hobby. And uh, they and we're, we're the same friends from school and uh, with some success, I might add, they, they actually you know, made some liquid fuel rockets, the, our chemical fuel rockets, enough for the U.S. military and JPL laboratories in Pasadena. That's Jet Propulsion Labs, not Jack Parsons Labs. That became a kind of a joke later. But uh, to give him grants to actually develop a rocket thruster for aircraft, the Americans were not interested in rockets. They were having tremendous success with aviation and building airplanes. So they, they didn't really have an interest in rockets. Uh, so he, he he formed a company, a jet propulsion company, Aerojet Company, and they they successfully built during World War II thousands of these rocket motors to give an aircraft a, a boost, right? And uh, while this was all going on, he was in underneath a Hollywood sign. He heard about this thing called. He was always interested. In, he was an you know was an educated man. He was the head of the, the Los Angeles Science Fiction Club, and he was always interested in offbeat things. And he was invited to this uh, this this Thelema group in, in in Hollywood, and they had a thing called the, the Gnostic Mass, and it's basically an, a, a mass that they do, and it just blew his mind. And so he he realized that there were answers here that were outside the that explain the strange things in science or in accidents that should have like accidents that went wrong, but they actually turned out to be the right thing. There was like a, an unseen force in the universe. He, he, he drew himself wholly into magic and the occult. At the same time, he was building the rockets. At the same time, he was in contact before World War, this is before World War II, with Werner von Braun, who eventually invented the Saturn V rocket. He was shocked, and all the Americans were shocked to find out just how far behind the rockets were in America compared to Germany. The Germans were light years ahead. But and Ver, Ver, Werner von Braun was also a science fiction head, which is very interesting. These guys were brought they, they took science fiction and made it into reality in many ways. His life, he, he started this thing called the Agape Lodge, which was in Pasadena. And it was um, basically a kind of a, a hippie loving thing before the hippies came along. And he was getting paid a good salary then by Aerojet Corporation. So he had this like commune we call it a commune of like artists and writers and you know good looking women and stuff like that after a while this guy called l ron hubbard comes in who goes on to be the founder of scientology jack parsons becomes spellbound by him mainly because parsons had lacked his father walked out on him when he was young and he had this long-term need for a father figure and he got interested in introduced to people like crowley through dialogue and letters and Crowley and Parsons became kind of surrogate father figures for him. They became, his, you know, he used to write to Crowley in England saying, my beloved father and things like this. And there's a genuine affection there. Now, Crowley was getting, on, was getting on at this point. Now, they, Parsons and Hubbard really got into magic. And they had this concept of creating something called the Moonchild. And it's a really amazing story. There's a book by Crowley. It's an actual fictional novel. I mean, it's quite a fun read called Moonchild. I had a copy. I don't know where it is here. And it talks about a, a, an occult group who implanted into a woman a magical child called the Moonchild with, uh, with the process of making the human race eligible for the next stage of reality. You know, this kind of thing. Now, this was to appeal to Parsons and Hubbard in some way because maybe they were th Parsons was probably thinking, it's not going to be easy for humans to, to exist in space. As we found out, it's not. It's really, they come back with all kinds of health problems and mental problems and everything. So maybe this idea of the moon child appeared to him that we would actually build the, the human that would be ready for space. Something that uh, Stanley Kubrick played around with in 2001 and Arthur C. Clarke, the moon did the star child. They went out into the, the Mojave Desert and, and did this invocation called the Babylon working. And it was to, it was to get basically the whore of Babylon. And uh, they went out there with a book, and on the cover of the book was a woman with flaming red hair, and that was his personification of Babylon. And it's just amazing. When they come back from the ritual, 
this gorgeous red-headed vamp called Marjorie Cameron is waiting for Parsons in his in his in the Pasadena Lodge. That was his Babylon. And she just it's even more amazing. She was the first person in the United States, I believe, to make an official report of seeing a UFO in the desert. And she became his muse and so on. And, you know, so the Babylon ritual, it actually worked. It worked. Now, unfortunately, Parsons died in an accident when he was working on a new kind of rocket fuel and the motor exploded in his garage and killed him. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a there's talk that he was assassinated because he was working as a subcontractor for the for the uh, Israeli military at the time. So there's there's all kinds of rumors that the, well it's probably it probably is, could be true that the that the FBI or CIA killed him because he was given rec, rock you know records uh, details of American projects to the Israelis because they weren't allies at that time. But however, from that man's life, from two from two eight year old boys building rockets in the backyard, the Saturn V rocket landed on the moon, and you can draw a clean trajectory, and it's like oh my god, it's like. You know, they they started the rocket motor company Aerojet. They founded what became JPL. JPL brought over uh, Werner von Braun after the war for Project Blue, uh, Project uh, Blue Book, not Blue Book, uh, Project Paperclip. Paperclip. And then, yeah. yeah, and then that became the the Apollo pro, the Mercury program, Apollo program. The man landed on the moon, and it started with two little boys experimenting in passage. It's one of those kind of like, if it was if it was written out as a fictional story, you wouldn't believe it. Mm. what about um it, it just changes something different here thomas what about crop circles because they're just utterly fascinating what whether that's some blokes going out with a you know a spade and a one of those wooden wooden things or, or... i went to the barge pub about 10 years ago down there in that part of england where all the where all that goes on and i got talking to guys who were the bakers of the crop circles they're made by fellas they're made by men and women a lot of them seem to be tattoo artists for some reason however they will tell you that they're in a mystical state when they're doing it it's just some other it's, it's, you see unfortunately they, they throw the spacemen thing on everything aliens on everything uh, and it sort of like degrades the power of human consciousness in many ways and it kind of plays our down our abilities but these guys told me and i believed them that they're the ones who made the circles. They're basically, there's a whole bunch of them. And they go out there at night and they just sort of fall into them. They have a general idea of what they want to do, but they fall into a kind of a mystical state and create these stunning artworks in the in the cereal crops. I'm guessing once you get your head around it, it's basically, you know, you need a piece of string, don't you, with certain measurements on it. Yeah. And then every time you sort of go around the circle or, or there's squares and ev ev everything now, you you kind of go to your mark. And then if you flatten that bit of corn, <laughs> um, you, you're you're going to get these amazing, uh, amazing results. But it still takes a hell of a lot of plant work. And also it depends on, you know, you can fold the corn in different directions, great shading and patronation. So you can have like different like tones and stuff like that mm -hmm. as they spray from the air. But I would consider them guys in the shaman. That's what I would call them. Serial, they call them serialologists. But I would I would actually call them English shaman. They, you know, they, they, that's a, that to me, when I look at that now, and haven't spoken to these lads and, up close, I would say that that's the English shamanic tradition expressed in the starting in the 1980s and still continuing to today. Mm -hmm. Stonehenge, another gosh, what an enigma. What What's your take on it, Thomas? Because I know you've done some some work around this. A friend of mine called Mick, who was actually in the the English uh, Arm, British Army, uh, he's actually from Lancashire. He lives he lives here near me, and he was telling me that back in the 50s when he was a young lad doing his national service or whatever they had in England back then, that him and his friends were stationed down in by Stonehenge. And at the time, it wasn't really a tourist spot at all. It was just like you could walk right up to it. There was no admission fee or anything. And he said they stood in the circle and they, they could hear weird sounds. He told me, and this is like, a, this guy's a real like Lancashire man. He wouldn't make these things up. But he says, he goes, he goes Thomas, you hear weird sounds. And, uh, and there's something about that thing to do with sound. And uh, when we were talking, the sound would change. So I actually was fortunate enough to get into 
Stonehenge about seven years ago, myself and a, and a few people, uh, we were making a film. So we bought the license, they, they, the production company bought the license and I was there as the sun was rising inside Stonehenge itself. Uh, just me and a few other people. And I was like, you know, I was, I, I was like a little, I was like a little boy on Christmas morning. I was, I couldn't believe I'd managed to pull this one off, you know, but I did. And, uh, uh, the, you know, it's an incredible mystery. Okay. Now it's an incredible mystery. What made our ancestors build these phenomenal stone? Now they're everywhere. In Ireland, there's 40,000 of them. Now, not to the same spectacular level as Stonehenge. That's in a league by itself. But there, there was, there was, they, these people had a tech, the megalithic world is a technological world. Now, these people were highly intelligent. They were very advanced, but they operated with a kind of science that's not the science that we use today. And I also believe they would operate with a kind of mathematics that's not the mathematics we use today. Mm -hmm. They were off doing their own thing. You know, like some people speak French, other people speak Chinese. They were off doing their own thing. And this allowed them to perform these feats. I mean, you st no one can explain how Stonehenge was built from beginning. Now, they can explain how they, you know, like they hoisted the stones up and all this kind of thing. But the prevailing mystery is how they got the stones from the Pacelli Mountains in Wales to that part of England. And if you look at the, the, the theories have been that they brought them down as far as the Severn and a few other rivers, and they floated them over on barges, that they tried much smaller stones over the years to experiment with this, and they all sunk to the bottom of the river. And um, then they would have to go through an enormous way around this Severn, uh, you know, what, what do you call it when a river begins? Source. Uh, and then back down to the set you know, with these gigantic stones, it, you know. And so uh, that to me, like the building of the pyramids, it's like, no, we're being told a lot of bullshit here. We, we are. This is not true. And uh, rolling them on rollers across the, 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 the hills of central England, impossible, you know, after getting them down from the mountains. Well, this is one of these things you talked about earlier on about esoteric. And you know, mysteries held within parables and stories and mythologies. And in Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, story, Arturian Legends, he tells a story of how the stones from Stonehenge were actually originally in Ireland and were levitated to where they are in England now, right? It's always Plain. Now, and, and for years I was thinking that's absurd until I found out that that part of Wales used to be part of Ireland at the time of Merlin, who was a real character and really existed. Now, what that's really telling us is that that's a memory of a much more ancient time, a folk memory, going back as 5,000 years, perhaps. We know from studies at the University of in Lisbon and also the, in the University of Durham in England that they found out that fairy tales have a spectacular ancient origin like we'll go back 5,000 years to the Bronze Age at least and even much further so we're being told that uh, possibly the science here that in the Neolithic times they had a, a way and I do believe this now of levitating stones either through sound which is very the most likely one for me now or gravity of the earth was different and how do you explain these enormous, you know, 1,000, 1,500 ton lintels picked up at the Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek and flit into a slot 30 feet off the ground. We can't do that today. Well, we do, we, we can do it now in the last, say, 50 years. We have cranes, that, but they're like, they're not, they're not like cranes, like lifting cranes. You have to build like a whole structure. They're like the cranes they have in shipyards that lift ship, ships up like that. But they said that they were done with wooden pulleys and, and reed ropes. No, there was some, you know, the, 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 the lies of ancient ar ar archaeology are monumental. We are, be and I really do believe there was an Atlantean culture. You, it was probably wasn't called Atlantis, but absolutely in my heart, I've always kind of known it. And in the last 30 odd years of research, I now believe it, that there was a time before this where there was high technology. And, and, and that's, that's, what built Stonehenge, and that's what built all the incredible uh, ancient megaliths of the world, and that somehow was lost. Whether it was a catastrophe of some times, or the scientists all went mad, like they're going mad today, 
I don't know, but it, it existed. Yes, hidden again. It's hidden knowledge, or, or just not understood knowledge. But I traveled a lot in South. Uh, well, I've traveled a lot in the Americas, but I traveled a lot in Central and South America. And is it Omiyatepe? I, I, I'm probably getting the name wrong here, but you see these structures, and like you say, each block is like a thousand tons or something. Just, just incredible incredible and they're fitted together se seamlessly like literally they're not like square you know dead square or anything they're all different shaped sort of blocks and do, do we have any idea thomas how i mean you couldn't get a rizzler paper in between these blocks and there's hundreds if not thousands of them all fitted together to make say a a wall or something or, or a structure that we probably have no idea about but how 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 could they do that i don't know it's and it's all over the world i was in sri lanka on top of a mountain and there was that same interlocking stonework you know and when i asked the tour guide who built this was and he said oh, this is before the buddhists came to sri lanka and he said devil worshippers you know <laughs> you know this kind of thing and yeah i mean the uh, there are po polygonal walls that look remarkably like cell structures on plants, uh, some of them. And I do wonder, there are stones that, are, are, that exist in Romania called Trabons, and they're actually living stones, incredible as it sounds. They're, they move across the landscape. They're made from limestone, but they're, animal, they're some kind of like mineral or animal or fungus or something. They're a great mystery. So maybe these stones or these these one the, these walls that look like cell structures were actually grown. I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. Uh, again, it was a technology that we don't understand. That it's like, you know, those ones in Peru, it's like, what? You know, you look at them, what? How? What? You know, this kind of thing. In the 1970s, a Japanese science crew wanted to build a replica of a pyramid to show it could have been done with traditional engineering techniques. So they hired 100 laborers in Egypt. And on the Giza Plateau, they decided we're going to build a one fifth scale pyramid and to show it could have been done with with the tools that you know with this a so bronze chisels basically you know you know well they the first thing was they discovered that they couldn't cut the stones with chisels or, or any other way so they, they got electric chainsaws and they had to get several of them to cut the stones blocks then they found out that the stone block one ton they couldn't even move it a few inches so they had they went down with something quarter of that size so the pyramid the, the original pyramid they're going to build is now quarter of the size they realized they couldn't float that small stone on a barge across the Nile using, you know, papyrus rafts. So then they hired a ship and took them across the Nile. They got on the other side and tried to build a pyramid and got so frustrated with trying to build it that they ended up using a helicopter and an industrial crane to make a pyramid about 30 foot high. And then they declared that science had proven that, they, that traditional engineering had built the pyramid. Now, this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a kind of... a uh, and we saw it in the, all through the last three mysterious years, haven't we? A kind of a gaslighting by intellectuals and academics who cannot accept that there's perhaps answers out there that they'll never answer. So they make up lies and tell you about them. Like, let's let's talk about Easter Island, right? You know, Easter Island with the Moai mm -hmm. statues, right? If back in 2012, the National Geographic Society claimed they solved that all statues were moved from the quarry. They were rocked up and down a road by fellas on ropes, right? And they made a small-scale version of one of the statues and rocked it down a road a few feet and said, there you go, solved. They deliberately hid that those Easter Island statues go all the way under the ground to their feet. They're full-size statues, not just the bits sticking up outside in the ground. And that's what they moved. So they fraudulently conducted a scientific experiment. There's a thousand of these Moai statues on an island that's small, about the size of the island of White in England. How the hell was there enough resources, food, wood, labor force to actually do create that amount of statues? It's this the, the ancient past. You know, you, you know they, that's why they want us looking at outer space. You know, they want us all thinking about you know distant cosmos. You know, things that we can we'll never. We'll never confront in our own lives. Uh, I'll never know a black hole not exists. But I know the Easter Island statues, Stonehenge and those polygonal walls in Peru exist. I want answers to that. I want answers to the bizarre, huge animals under the sea. 
that they found. And they go, no, 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 look at the look at the look at the quasars in outer space. And that's that's almost like they're gaslighting. They're saying, look over here, so the average person doesn't link, look at the world around them and say, they they haven't answered shit about so many things. The uh, I saw a fascinating documentary on the Easter Islands and one of the theory and this is where stuff doesn't make you know contradicts itself is one of the theories was these people were so obsessed with uh praying to their ancient ancestors from i'm guessing from the the land that they came from whether that be south america or some other island and polynesia they say po polynesia yeah and in that process of creating these um these statues they chopped down all the trees on the island and then as a result of that they had nothing to you know they sort of killed all the you know killed their source of uh, firewood and and um source of building boats and rafts and this kind of stuff um and and that led to their their demise have, have you heard that one Yes, and it's nonsense, and it's also offensive. You've been all over the world like me. Human beings do not destroy the place that keeps them alive. Yeah, they, 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 this assumption that they were like some... When I was a kid, right, on our, in Ireland on a, in, in school, we were doing the history of the world, and they showed us a 16 millimeter film of Julius Caesar landing in England, right, in, and, and in Britain, and, and you know meeting the Britons, right? Now, this was an English film, so don't blame the Irish, right? This was from your school system, right? And there's Julius Caesar. He gets off the boat in the south of England, you know, and he's, he's, you know, his toga and the, the big metal plate and all the legionnaires behind him looking fantastic in their uniforms. And literally, they show the Britons with animal skins on beh behind the, the sand dunes going like that. And we're still dealing with that. They have this attitude through this Dar Darwinian evolution that the 40 you go back, the more stupid people are. You know, so they, they say, well, the only reason to that, that what happened in Easter Ireland was the people were so stupid that they cut down all their firewood and then went one day, you know, like Lauren Hardy. You know, that's what that's what they do. In the Temple of Gigantia in Malta, in the interpretive center, they show cartoon drawings of Homer Simpson-like characters building this ancient megalithic stone temple. And the guys are, again, the animal skin thing, you know, like in Carry On Caveman, right? And uh, the guy looks like Homer Simpson. One guy's dropping the hammer that's bouncing off the other guy's head. It's all gaslighting. It's all to make us think that people in the past were stupid. People in the past were idiots. And they all, you know, and it, it, they, if they did achieve anything, they just did it because they used our methods today. This comes out of the colonialist mentality, and you know that the old days of the old colonial empires of the world, going around the world and assuming that, like, you know, that everyone was savages that weren't them, and they applied that to history, things to like the Royal Geographic Society and so on. You know, it's it's incredible, really. And uh, I was, you know, what we were just talking about then, the Easter Island thing. So here's one about Easter Island. Those statues are buried up to here, right? There's not enough soil on Easter Island, uh, organic material, and it is, it, is, it, is, it is organic material, to come up to here on these statues that go down to their feet. That is many thousands of years of accumulation of soil, right? Now, they say those statues are only about 1,500 years old max. Now, then I say to myself, no, that's, that, there's, not enough, so, there's too much soil there. There's too much soil there. On a, on a small island that's in the middle of nowhere, it's practically in Point Nemo, the polar, uh, the, the polar area of complete isolation. You know, it's it, it's it's it, it. When you're on Easter Island, the nearest human beings to you are in the ISS space station overhead. That's how remote Easter Island is. So it wasn't organic material that blew from a nearby I larger islands or anything. So you say to yourself, okay, it's volcanic ash, maybe. The last volcanic eruptions on Easter Island were 100,000 years ago. Now you're opening the Pandora's box because you can't carbon date stone. So is Easter Island 100,000 years old? And then this opens up all the whole thing about the Atlantis of the Pacific, Lemuria, and all that other stuff.
I, I, I'm I'm aware there's different theories on evolution. I'm not here to upset anyone, folks. Just just I, I, I would say that what whatever we've been here for an awful lot longer time than I think history wants. I mean, the World Economic Forum. They want you to believe we came out the African bowl 80,000 years ago. And, and that's just like nothing in terms of, you know, changing our facial appearance and our, but also that there could have been many evolutions before us or civilizations that like you say, Thomas developed this technology, which to them was just like normal. And of course that civilization stops for whatever reason you know, some cataclysmic event or, or whatever it might be. We don't know. We don't. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of gatekeeping goes on. There's a megalithic site near here, uh, Caramore, where in the 1990s, they did a, the first full major investigation on this on this thing. And it's, it's covered in Julian Cope's book, uh, The Modern Antiquarian. And uh, I know the people who work down there, and I used to, I used to hang out and sleep in that, that place years ago. And uh, they so they finally opened it up, and they got they got the holy grail of a carbon dating stamp. There were Swedish research team that op and opened the thing up, and there was two heavy slabs of stone on one on top of there, and inside the middle was some soil that was original to the build because there's no way I could have penetrated from either the front or the back. It was completely sealed inside by accident, right? So that's the mother law. That's the stuff that, that whatever soil is in there and you carbon date back, that's the age of that, those two stones are put together because there's no other way to get in, right? Because like it, normally what they normally do is they live like Stonehenge when they reconstructed in the 1940s, they lift up the stone, take a soil sample from underneath and then, that that carbon date, assuming that the stone was placed on top of the soil. But what happens is bunny bu bunny rabbits and worms and everything else mess the soil up underneath. Mm -hmm. So moles. So uh, that this was this was the mother law. This is what you want, right? The Swedish team carbon dated at twelve thousand BC. Twelve thousand BC made a big announcement in 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 the Irish media that we found the oldest megaliths in the world which they probably weren't because I bet Stonehouse is probably the same, similar period as well. And uh, the Irish archaeological people stood up and says, this is this is bad science. Go back and get the right date. Yes. A lot, of, a lot of that crap goes on, you know. And there's been massive gatekeeping in Egypt, isn't there? They, they've got their narrative and they want you to believe the pyramids are only 4,000 years old or something. And, and there's no insight given into the fact that they could have been they could have been there to create energy with the, well, they, look the... Like they look like industrial complexes hmm. the, the three great have you ever heard harry houdini, the harry houdini story about underneath the sphinx have you ever heard that story the, no, the can, can you enlighten us harry houdini approached the american writer hp lovecraft in, 19, in the early, mid 1920s to write a story that he said actually happened and Lovecraft, who became quite friends with uh, Houdini, said that he was having me on. You know, had me on. But he wrote, he, he, Houdini was great at every lots of things, but he wasn't a very good writer. His English wasn't his first language. So, uh, uh, Lovecraft, who he was a fan of, wrote the story up and was put up. Houdini claimed that when he was in Cairo on tour, he had come into the circle of some kind of esoteric group right and uh they put him bashed him over the head and threw him down a shaft a secret shaft at the sphinx anyway he woke up inside underneath the sphinx inside the giant cavern and enc and encountered super beings that live inside the earth now houdini was a man known for debunking and you know exposing fraudulent mediums and, and 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 all this kind of thing and he swore to lovecraft it actually happened as lovecraft said he's just having a laugh and putting me on but if underneath the pyramids and it's it's a great it's an amazing story it's it's online for free if you want to read it uh he, he found this subterranean world of non-human beings who originally claimed to have built all the great megaliths in egypt and the story is 
it's plausible. You know, it's like you read this and think, oh, come on. He says, was this the April 1st edition? But the Houdini maintained to his dying day that he had this experience underneath the, underneath the Sphinx. So who knows? You know, who knows that these, I often wonder, and while it is true, that these like advanced sort of like brotherhoods, you know, the high ends of all these secret societies. And, you know, we, we're, we're into the conspiracy world now, but I'm a very, I'm very comfortable in the conspiracy world. I make no, you know, I, I, you know, from the time when I was a little kid and found that about JFK, I am not, I'm not, I'm very comfortable being called a conspiracy theorist in that, in that sense. Uh, there's, I don't run, I don't run at all from it. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, I often wonder if these, secret organizations like the WEF, these kinds of people, and all these weirdos that are in charge of the world. Oh, we're not, they're all weirdos. Well, you wouldn't have a pint with them down the pub. You wouldn't go for a coffee with them at your lunch break. You know that kind of a thing? And yet there's something fundamentally wrong with them. I often wonder if they're somehow taking orders from a non-human intelligence at times, because especially now, especially since 2020, they seem to have a loathing for the ordinary human being. I, I want to know where that comes from. You know, it's more than just snobbery and elitism. It's almost like they're, they're a different species at this point or see themselves that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what fascinates me is how you network and, um, <clears throat> Once you see their network and you see how cleverly they move people into they they move people into all positions of power when you when you look at the enlightenment spectrum highest form of vibration energy frequency whatever we're going to call it is love um it's the thing that gets you the best results in life there's nothing to be got from living in hate and fear and anxiety da -da 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 -da. and yet all the people in power the world over are dedicated to hatred. They're yeah. dedicated to destroying community, putting people in a box, controlling them through all kinds of fictitious narratives and false science and like trying to get too conspiratorial here. But it does make you wonder when you start thinking, when you hear people um, talk about interactions with aliens, and I'm I'm really like my jury is just completely out on this, folks. Don't I'm um, you know like show me some evidence. I'll be like, yeah, Roger got you. But just purely from the perspective of liking to look at all different theories and options, and not necessarily putting all my chips on that square. But you hear, I think Robert Sepper talks a bit about, um. You know, was there a, some kind of alien life form that that infiltrated the human species at some point, which gave us this hu huge leap forward in terms of um, intelligence from, say, for example, our our primate, the rest of the the, uh, the primates, and then you start to when you hear talk of you know reptilians and cold cold blood it's that cold bloodedness that we're seeing in society this just literally like you can wipe out i don't know you know three thousand people in a in an event you know got to be careful what i say here but think of the events of the last 20 20 years folks you probably know the one that i'm referring to or you can send them all off to war yo is this cold bloodedness or is this just people that live so much in their ego and uh, that they're almost so sociopathic um over to you to you thomas because <laughs> i uh, i don't buy the whole alien intervention thing uh, i don't even buy, believe that alien, there's any evidence that aliens have actually visited this earth hmm. uh, if you really look into it uh, I mean, space aliens and spaceships, that's what I'm talking about, okay? Mm. And uh, the evidence is just not there. And that's that Zachariah Sitchin thing is on. It's very dodgy, the whole thing of, like, the Anunnaki. That's, it's, it's a very dodgy translation of Sumerian text. However, yeah. let's deal with something outside that one specific thing that, 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 that fits nicely with Christians and their whole thing. Let's talk about every single indigenous culture and in Europe as well. Don't, don't assume that this is... Um, 
native people around the world believe in another form of consciousness and other beings that exist in, outside the perception of humanity, right? I'll talk about the Irish thing, the fairies, right? People from outside of Ireland think that when P Irish people mention the fairies or fairy culture, they're talking about Tinkerbell and things like that. Within Irish folk tradition among the country people, not so much now, but like my, my grandmother's generation, right? They lived in absolute terror of the fairies. They were called the she, S-I-D-H-A is spelled in Irish. These were a malevolent beings. And if you saw one, you did everything to stay away from them. Uh, they kidnapped babies. They messed with people's lives. They were ma malicious. They were malevolent. They had a pathological hatred of humans. You get this all through folk traditions all over the world. The Watiko of, and it's sort of uh, the Native American tradition. It always seems to blend in with two things. One, they have uh, the jinn in the Islamic world. They have a, a dislike and almost like a, a vicious jealousy of humans. However, they have the ability in the in Native American thing, with Tico, to, or in the changeling and the Celtic fairy tradition, to infect the human possession. And these humans who are affected by this complementary consciousness that exists in another dimension start acting out the desires of the other side in this world. So about 10 years ago, I was at a, some kind of, it was kind of a, a spiritually new age thing in Dublin I was going to, and I just wanted to, uh, just to see what it's like. And I met in the, in the bar, this guy, he was an, an African shaman, a little tech guy. He's just big, huge, you know, hello, my friend, you know, like, like this lovable African teddy bear, I'd call him, in his big, bright colored shirt. And he was knocking back pints of Guinness and stuff like that. And he says, so tell me, my friend, what are you into? You know, tell me. <laughs> and they like Eddie Murphy in Trading Places. And I said, uh, <laughs> I said, I'm fascinated by psychopaths and psychopathology. And he goes, oh, yes, that's the demon world trying to invade this world. And you know what? That's one of the wisest things I ever heard in my life. And uh, I think he was right. I think that these monsters you see on the, the TV, these billionaire, quote unquote, philanthropists, have an element of non-human consciousness with inside them. And this is, you know, you can be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, an atheist even. And this can be even rationalized in atheism. If you think of consciousness as an unlocalized field, that, um, and you bring in things like, you know, quantum, the quantum, you know, the quantum world and entanglement and things like this, that we're dealing with people who are not us. They're, 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 either, they're, they're infected or something. And they see us as a pest on this planet. And we have to be dealt with accordingly. And that's exactly the mentality of some. There's a video of Bill Gates and his his former lady going on about the you know what. And he goes, and the next one will be even worse. And he looks at her and she looks at him. And they're like two kids who are planning to do a practical joke on people going. Mm. Yes. You know? Yeah, you know, you you sit back and you go, if that was me or you, we'd be sectioned. Hillary Clinton, after she found that Gaddafi had been murdered, as we came, we saw he died. <laughs> <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. In the most horrific way, went live on television, and was literally in a state of sadomasochistic psych sexual psychosis, mm -hmm. screaming. We came, we saw, he died. If that was you or me or your mate or someone there in the pub who behaved like that in public, they'd be in the psych ward that evening mm. and not us. Ah, oh, Thomas, you bring up some great stuff, mate. You really do. Um, a couple of things I want to uh, with this. Let me just say three things just so we all can consider this. First off, I just want to say to our friends out there, like I've been a sociopath in periods of my life. When I was younger and I was trying to make sense of the world and I, you know, I went through, I, you know, I can look back now and realize I went through a period where I didn't care for other people. 
Um, I thought this life is tough. It's dealt me a hard hand. You know, I've dealt with some stuff as a youngster that, you know, n no one supported me. Therefore, f you, I will, I'm going to go out and take what. And of course, you, um, I, I won't say I'm like utterly ashamed of that now because again, life is just experience, but for intents and purposes, yeah, of course I'm, I'm, I'm utterly sad that I ever hurt another human being, you know, yeah. and, and fortunately I came out the other side of it. Uh, again, uh, you know, addiction helped that hitting rock bottom and, and, and starting to think, oh my God, we're all just struggling on this planet. You know, we're all trying to get ahead. You know, I'm a great believer. Take away the mainstream media. We all just bloody love each other because you can go into any bar in any part of the world, meet anyone from any nation and within literally within 30 seconds, you'll turn around and go, all right, mate, uh, uh, where are you from? And 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 you you become my experience on eighty five countries across the planet is you become best mates within like thirty minutes, you know. And there's no phobias and you know religion and 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 politics and da 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 da. da. So that's the one thing I want to say is that I luckily had the sociopath cracked out of me. I ended up in a in a police cell. I was very fortunate it didn't go any further and at that point i was like oh my god what are you what have you been doing you know um so that that, that was one thing so with respect to like the bill gates of the world i i think they're in that mode where they're so hyped up on hubris and their position in life and the money that that they don't have like the downfall that I had. I got I got banged up. That's enough. One night in a police cell is enough for me you to to look at your behaviour and go, oh shit, what have I been doing? You know, um, you know, I was uh, like stealing cars and stuff, folks. In case in case you're wondering, um, and it, and it was wrong. You know, it, it it was so so wrong. But back then, I so much justified it because. Like in my mind, these people hurt me. They hurt you. Yeah, they didn't do enough. Anyway, that's one thing. The, the second thing, Thomas, is that I remember I put a post out a, a while back about addiction, and I talked about going into psychosis um, from taking too much crystal And I always try and explain this, and I still kind of believe in this that if this is the synapses of of, of your brain functioning you know you, your neurons firing you got your transmitters and your receptors when, when when you overload it with chemicals it starts to like do this so you get these distorted thought patterns and, and narratives in in and someone wrote a comment on, and, I, and i don't forget it and it said no, actually, Chris, what you've done is you you lowered your defenses through, you know, through through this behavior, and you allowed the jinn, you know, the demons from the dark side in. And do you know what, Thomas? I wouldn't argue with them. It's like that's basically exactly you start getting these thoughts in your head, and and they're not they're not helpful. Um, fortunately, I didn't. I had a few that were a bit. Bloody one! One of them told me to go and throw myself off a crane into the harbour in Hong Kong. I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> Looking back, it's probably really, really silly. Um, so that was the second thing, just uh, um, relating to you to um, to what you said. And the third thing I was going to say is, I read your book. Uh, I read your book on psychopaths. What, what's the title of it for, for everybody? Uh, Puzzling People, The Labyrinth of the Psychopath. Yes. Utterly fascinating again. It's well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you t said that because what you were describing is very much what I've laid out in the book. You know, this is from my own experience. Of, I, I grew up in a very tough neighborhood, the north side of Dublin. 
So I was aware of the teenage joyriders, junkies, and all that kind of carry on. And what I would call proto-psychopathic, they came from bad homes. They had abusive parents, an alcoholic father, a father wasn't there, or they might have been sexually molested by an uncle or something when they were a little kid. And they lashed out and they did all the things you're talking about. And then there was sort of like a moment that fixed them, like they met a nice girl or they had, their girlfriend had a baby. And suddenly they became the productive, loving, healthy, normal person they were meant to be. They were, pro they were made proto-psychopathic by either the abuse they had suffered or by the, uh, the trauma they had inflicted through drugs, like, you know, you know, heavy drug use. Things like sniffing glue would be very bad for that. Now, what that seems to do is the brain has there's, there's, there's the frontal, the, 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 the back of the brain where the reptilian cortex is held. That's, a, that's just, this part of the brain right here is, is, um, is concerned primarily with survival. It's fight or flight, kill or be killed, get laid, get dinner, get this, this kind of thing, make babies, blah, blah, blah. There's a section in, this, in the middle called the amygdala, and the amygdala is like the, the gearbox of the brain, right? And that presents, you know, you're dealing with some asshole at work and you go, you know, I, I, but what take, stops you from slapping her around in the, in the bathroom uh, or your lunch break is the amygdala that kicks in like the gearbox of the brain and stops these electronic impulses from reaching the frontal cortex. You know, so you go, when you're messed up on drugs, or you're very badly psychologically damaged, the amygdala that doesn't work that well. And that's what lets the gin from here, the reptile from here, from here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's that it's that simple. Now, this did not explain when I got older and ended up living in New York and working in Wall Street and mostly investment, all, nearly all investment banks. How there were people there who were very cold blooded, sadistic, and could tell jokes and laugh about doing business in Central America that would destroy people's lives. And these all came from privileged. Now, first of all, I want to say most of the people I dealt with on Wall Street are wonderful human beings. They're just ordinary people trying to make a living for their families, right? Mm -hmm. But you know that the types are out there too. How they came from well-off, comfortable, well-to-do backgrounds. They never suffered a day in their lives. And yet they were full of the same shit that the lads in Ballymun, where I grew up, were, were full. They were driven by the same pathologies, right? And they had no reason to be. And there was a sadism. There was, an element, there was a strong sadism element there. I stumbled across the work of Dr. Robert Hare in British Columbia, who studied psychopaths, mostly criminals, but not exclusively. And some other work, other authors out there in studies, and discovered that there is an actual... While there's a thing called what I call a proto psychopath, which is what happened to you when you went on when you went at your worst points, right? But that you're that's not that's not doesn't mean you're one of them. It just means that it happened. Something happened. The trauma caused that, right? The meth and whatever. Then there's ones who are born naturally like that, and if you put them under an fMRI scan, their brains are actually different. They actually have very little activity in the frontal cortex, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the synapses are firing to a much lesser degree. Now, in your frontal cortex is where you process dreams, feelings of affection, feelings of compassion, this kind of thing. And, this, you know, and so on for other people. And understanding, the, the understand, it's, it's a part of the brain that has this understanding, you know, that you can't, you can't be selfish, right? It's literally switched off in them. It's not broken. It's all there. It's not damaged. It's switched off. And they exclusively exist in the reptilian cortex at the back of the brain. Now, this is so interesting on so many levels. The, the studies were done that they wanted to know why, you know, there's a, there's a very famous video of Ted Bundy, and there's a few of them, actually, the serial killer. When he's getting away with stuff and he thinks he has the court by the... Because he was in court, he wanted to be seen. You know, they all have this, like grandiosity thing that his he thought when he was getting away, his eyes would go like this when the psychopath is going in for the kill the eyes widen you know the wide like a like a reptile right now what they discovered was in one research was that at the back of the brain is the reptilian cortex but it's also where the optical cortex nerves come back around 
and they're processed in the spinal cord at this point, the lower brainstem. And it floods with a chemical, a, a, a neurochemical called a, a norepinephrine. And the norepinephrine floods when they're in a state of uh, fight or flight, floods in a psychopath in an enormous level all around the lower brainstem. And it excites the optical cortex and hence why their eyes go like that. And you can watch the Ted Bundy videos and see it in real time. And it's like, it answers, that's why I wrote that book, because it answered so many questions for me about people I'd encountered in my life in both situations, how someone was a complete piece of shit when they were younger and then grew to be a wonderful, loving, successful person. And also these ones who were just monsters, predators all their lives. The sort of Patrick Bateman in American Psycho. And I said, this knowledge is, and it actually ironically happened from me reading books about serial killers while I was working in Wall Street and I was going, this kind of thing, you know, profiles. And uh, this information was too good not to share with the world because it helped me tremendously. You know, have being bullied at school, who, these people have bullied me at school and things like that, or things like that. And it made me realize. And then fellows who bullied me at school years later coming over and put their arms around me said, how are you doing? And I'm like, why, why, is, why is he nice now? You know, and I realized he was messed up from his childhood. And um, so I, I, that's where puzzling people came from. I just, I just said, this is too good for people not to know, you know. You know, I've met people that have been affected by psychopaths. And, oh, geez, it really gets under people's skin, doesn't it? You know, it. It, it it because of the nature of the person that's been preyed upon being a vulnerable person it 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 you know i get psychopaths I, you know i've dealt with them and and i'm just sat there going <laughs> dude you you're fucking gaslighting me just you you like literally picked the wrong person to try and gaslight <laughs> like but, and what and what was the last three and a half years? Non-stop gaslighting. Wow, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. why those of us who were aware didn't fall for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, like, it's like that that line in the outlaw Josie Wales where Clint Eastwood goes, Don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. You know, it was literally mm -hmm. That's why I think that there was a and it, a, a lot of credit goes to everybody in the old media, I think. I'm not just saying myself, but people like Alex Jones and David Icke, that made people cynical to the mainstream. You know, they deserve credit for that, you know, because they planted the seed that made people say, I don't like you, BBC, and I don't like what you're trying to do to me right now. Now they're awful. And now they've got this, um, was this Mariana Spring? She's their special correspondent for... Uh, uh, for want of a better her proper term is like for conspiracy theories <laughs> rich planet i'm not sure if you're aware of his channel yeah, I, know, I, know, I know the chap rich rich d hall yeah yeah richard hall and and he's just a nice guy doing his best to, to to enlighten us and help us all go forward and and what they did to him and the way that they do it is so cheesily sickeningly like if you see it, you you see what they're doing. You can see the process, um, but of course the masses um, don't see it. You know they they they. they... Oh, that was that was his payback. Uh, that was that was a get back for the work he did on the McCanns. That work he did on the McCanns was incredible. Yes, and, phenomenal. Uh, and that's that's what that that's when the wanted posters went up on that poor guy. Yeah. And the Manchester thing, just just gonna say Manchester thing, guys. That was the that was the axe they used to um, chop him up with, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't, I didn't, I didn't follow that too much. But when I saw the, and I saw the, uh, when I finished the whole series on that child that went missing, I was like, uh, they're gonna come after this chap for this. Yeah, 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 yeah. It it gets. <laughs> You can you can see from the work he did there, it it gets so deep. It's like my friend John Waters, the former like big mainstream journalist here in Ireland, now turned maverick, says that a conspiracy theorist is is the person doing the job that journalists used to, used to do. Yeah, exactly. 
Thomas, on that note, I'm going to love you and leave you, brother. Um, not because I want to. Have you got several books? It's it's only the Psychopath one that I've read. I, I, I'll give you a link to my uh, Substack page, and that has links to everything. Okay. And also, I've got a, a, the channel that the movie documentary that you saw was because called Beyond Room 313 is on YouTube. And there's, I'm doing a very popular Sunday night show there called Hocus Focus, where we explore mysteries, mm. you know, kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so I'll get, I've got I've got like a, a a link tree link as well that gets because I've got so many sites and bits and bobs all over the place. But uh, yeah, so I, I recently added a new book page to my Substack page. It's a uh, because uh, sadly one of the best book retailers uh, book deposit the depository it was gone down, and they were like. Uh, they were very fair to the people, their authors, in terms of payment and stuff. But they've been wiped; they're getting wiped out. So that's kind of sad. But yeah, I'll get, I'll, 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 I'll throw to your, your, your admin guy the links. Yeah, if you can, mate, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thomas, stay on the line just so I can thank, thank you properly. But for the purposes of the recording, massive thanks for coming on the show. It's, uh, it's been lo- long overdue, can we say? Yes, and thanks very much, uh, Chris. I've been follow. I've been catching up on your show as well, and really enjoying it. So, mm. may there be many more strings to your bow as well. Yes, definitely, and uh, I look forward to really look forward to working with you in the future. To our friends at home, as always, I hope you got as much out of that as um, as I did. Uh, just remember, folks, you might not agree with me. You might not agree with. To- e- e- that is irrelevant. The fact is you've got two good guys here who are just talking and you can take the bits, you know, you take the bits that, 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 that help, that, that help you. What you don't want to do is throw the baby out with a bath war. You know, I might've said one thing in there that upset you. Okay. I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. I can't know everything. I can't know everything. And just going, Oh, well, he just said that, that, you know, this, this, just like support the people that are like, trying to do their best folks for, for all of us. Anyway, sorry, lecture over with massive, massive love to you, my friends. If you can like, and subscribe, click the notification bell. Da-da-da-da-da-da. You've heard it all before and we'll see you soon. Thank you.